Anna Valerie is a conservation specialist with Houston Audubon. She runs the Natives Nursery, manages two northern sanctuaries, and helps manage the Bird Friendly Communities Program. Her love of wildlife is lifelong, but she discovered her love of birds during an internship on Midway Atoll, working with the Lace and Albatross. Since then, Anna has completed a master's degree studying Galveston Bay shorebirds, seabirds, and wading birds at the University of Houston Clear Lake. She is now surrounding herself with all the bird knowledge Houston Audubon has to offer. And we really welcome you and thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be presenting for your chapter because it's so closely affiliated with UH Clear Lake and EIH because that's where I went to school. So I have a, a soft spot in my heart for you guys. So I am the program director for the um, Bird Friendly Communities program for Houston Audubon. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about Bird Friendly Communities and how uh, you can kind of apply the Bird Friendly Communities principles in your own yards and personal communities. Houston Audubon turned 50 last year, and this organization was developed to promote conservation of birds and other wildlife in the Houston area. And for those of you who don't know, Houston Audubon has 17 sanctuaries around the greater Houston Galveston region. The two that I manage are Damoth and Winters Bayou, way, way up near Cleveland, Texas. But we have two urban sanctuaries. Edith L. Moore Nature Sanctuary is where our headquarters is, and it's a really pretty woodland sanctuary if you're ever over on that side of town. That's also where our native plant nursery is. And then Sims Bayou is now called our Houston Audubon Raptor and Education Center. And it's open to the public and you can go and see all of the different raptors that we have who come to us from different ailments. So now they're educational raptors. It's really a beautiful sanctuary as well. And then we're really well known for our high island sanctuaries. In particular, Boy Scout Woods is home to a huge water bird rookery where people from all over the world come to see birds nesting. You get to see all the egrets and herons and spoonbills up really close. And we just opened up a canopy walkway there. And it's really a, a cool addition to that sanctuary. So I would definitely recommend taking the trip to go and enjoy some birds out there. Okay, bird friendly communities. So birds make any place a chance for discovery. They make a garden seem wild. They're a little bit of wilderness coming into a city park. So. Our region is a kind of an anomaly. The Houston Galveston area is so incredibly important for birds and Texas in particular is super important for a high number of different bird species. There's actually been six, over 600 species of birds documented in Texas, either living here permanently or just migrating through. And about two and a half million birds come through our region every spring and every fall. So our area is, Kind of unique because we're right in between the central flyway with a little bit of the Mississippi flyway. So we get birds coming from all over the north migrating down south. But Houston is an anomaly because we are such an enormous urbanized city. So birds that used to come through are facing all of these challenges that you all are, I'm sure are very familiar with living in Houston. So this is, I'm gonna encourage you to kind of check out either the Houston area or the person joining us from Pennsylvania. Keep your eyes peeled on the Pennsylvania region. But I'm gonna click through, this is as the years go by, this is the, the amount of housing per square kilometer. So you can just see how intense our Houston, Galveston area, it, the development over the years has really just exploded. And this is my graphic from Cornell's BirdCast program, and uh, it shows it one night migration. Um, the red is where all of these birds are migrating through. And that is that red indicates 112 to 178 estimated million birds. And these are actual pockets of birds as they're kind of coming through our region. Our region is called a fire escape in ecology, and it's when birds are migrating from South America up to uh, northern U.S. and Canada and Alaska, um, they're flying directly, oftentimes directly across the Gulf of Mexico. So they're, you know, these tiny little birds are just like hauling all the way across that huge body of water. And they, when they get, when they arrive, if they run into have weather or if they're running out of resources to finish that, they're going to stop the first safe place that they can land. And um, that's in, a lot of times is our region. 
So it's called a fire escape because it's like, oh, I have an emergency and I need to stop on this migration to rest and refuel. So my favorite example of this is the buff-breasted sandpiper. So this is an upland shorebird. So it likes grassy fields and um, use like prairie habitats and that kind of thing. And they do migrate through a region. You'll see them in a lot of times in like sod fields um, where they're growing sod, but you'll also see them in like actual nice habitat and things like that. This was one female buff-breasted sandpiper. And this is her route from her nesting area down to her wintering area. And you can see that this bird on her way south went from our Texas coast across the Gulf of Mexico to that isthmus. But on her way back, she went from the tip of uh, the northern tip of South America all the way across the Gulf to, to get to where we are. And so that first route that she took is about 600 miles. But the second one she took is 1800 miles and these are not big birds and they're having to, that is an incredible journey to take for days on end they're flying. And they used to arrive to our area and be greeted by the habitat that they, they evolved to rely on. And so Houston was primarily prairie habitat as I'm sure this group knows better than anyone um, with riparian corridors and these birds really relied on that right down that prairie habitat to, to land, to have shelter, to have food, and for access to water in those riparian corridors. Um, but unfortunately, prairies are really easy to build on. Um, they're easy to, to mow and then come through and put in housing developments like this. And that's kind of the, the tricky thing about Houston is it's just continued to spread. And so where there used to be all of this really great habitat for these birds to rest and refuel on their migratory journeys, it's gone. And so that's where bird-friendly communities comes in. Bird-friendly communities, the, the whole theory behind it is that every green space counts. So as a city, as, a, as my own little backyard, or as an actual whole community, um, we can take all of our green space available and actually turn it into habitat for our resident and migratory birds and other wildlife. So there are four main aspects of bird-friendly communities, and I'm gonna walk you through them. And We'll start with the first one, but I just want to note that it can, this um, program can be implemented at any scale. It can be like the balcony of your apartment, of your city apartment, all the way up to like the city of Houston. So it's really scalable uh, throughout the, the next four topics. All right, let's do a little warm up quiz. Let me start this poll. All right, what do chickadees feed their young? I started the poll, so let's see some answers. I imagine this group's gonna be pretty, pretty good. Uh, this is chickadees feeding their young, not the adults. All right, we've got 50, 60% oh, voted. All right, ending the polling. All right, so 87% of you guys got that right. So chickadees, even though they, the adults mostly feed on seeds and and nuts and that kind of thing, they exclusively feed their young insects. And so they're totally reliant on insects for, for reproduction. All that. All right, but now the, the tricky part is how many caterpillars does a chickadee need to feed an entire clutch? So chickadee clutches are typically like four to six birds, sometimes a little bigger, sometimes a little smaller. And this is one nest in one season. So like one mom and dad chickadee raising their little nest of birds. How many caterpillars would it take? All right, let's see what you guys got. Okay, so a lot of you got it right. 9,000 caterpillars is what it takes to raise one single clutch of chickadees. And you, I'm sure as uh, if any of you have backyard feeders, you are seeing the number of chickadees that come to your feeder. So it takes a ton of insect mass to raise these little birds. And chickadees aren't the only species that primarily require insects for their young. It's something around 95% of land birds feed their young insects, regardless of what they eat themselves as adults. And so Supporting birds is really all about supporting insects when you really start to, to look to look at it, especially with when we're thinking about our land birds, so our resident and migratory land birds. And I am sure this group knows all about Doug Tallamy, but Doug Tallamy really illustrates this in his book, Bring Nature Home. A Nandina tree that is an ornamental that we don't suggest, it will host, host zero species of Lepidoptera and Lepidoptera's uh, moths and butterflies. 
Whereas an oak tree, one of our, our native oak trees in, in Texas can host over 500 different species of caterpillar. And that's not even the number of caterpillars, that's just the number of species. So a great example of why planting native is so important and why organizations like this are so awesome. And so there's also ways to support adult birds with native plants. This is a orchard oriole on a black cherry tree. We've got a black-throated blue warbler on an American beauty berry um, is a favorite. And then we've got a uh, blue jay with an acorn. So all of these different birds are, are not seed eaters and are relying on those species. But then the, our native forbs are really important for hosting those insects as well, which then feed all of these birds. And so these are some of our favorites in uh, Houston Audubon's nursery. And aquatic, aquatic milkweed is great for caterpillars. And then one we found in the nursery is a camouflage looper, which is another favorite. But then we have all of, not only do we have ornamental trees that, that just don't support wildlife, we have a number of invasive plants that are really tricky uh, for conservationists, especially in Houston. So the three that I typically find myself targeting uh, those two nature sanctuaries I manage or with Houston Audubon are these three. So Chinese privet, Japanese climbing fern, and Chinese tallow. They've all been introduced and they all spread really aggressively, often out competing some of our native plant species. The really frustrating part coming from uh, the conservation world is seeing things like Houston Garden Center advertise these species that we spend tons of money and so much time and effort trying to remove as fast growing shrubs with variegated foliage um, and really just like, oh, you should plant this at home. So that is a, a tricky part as I'm sure all of you know. But I always like to bring up that depending on where you live, things aren't always bad. So as mentioned in the introductory thing, I, I got into birds starting on an island in the middle of the Pacific called Midway. And I was there doing habitat restoration and seabird research. And one of the species that we really heavily targeted to remove because it was so bad for seabird nesting is this one. Now in the chat, does, every, does anybody know what this is? It is Texas frog fruit. And so this is a species that I now grow in the native plant nursery. But when I was on Midway, we were there removing it because it just didn't belong there. It, and it took over and ended up causing a lot of problems for the burrow nesting birds there. So this is the native plant nursery. Uh, I'm sure a number of you have been out to the natives nursery at our Edith Elmore Nature Sanctuary. But we grow about 60 to 70 different species of, of real deal native plants. And this nursery was started by a woman named Flo Hanna several years ago, and she was just very passionate about prairie plants. And we've kept it up, and we sell a lot of plants to partners uh, for habitat restoration, and a lot of the plants go to our own sanctuaries for habitat restoration. But we also have it open for the general public to come and shop. So if you all are, are welcome to come out there, and I will show the link of where you can online order. All right. So that was native plants, the, the really the staple of bird-friendly communities. The second part is creating inviting habitat. All right, I didn't do a poll for this one because it's just so easy. Which landscape better supports birds? We know it's A. Um, layers provide diversity of plants, which then provides diversity of insects, supporting a higher diversity of birds. So when you're thinking about how you're going to transform your own yard or your own community into a bird-friendly landscape, you really want to start thinking about those layers. The, there's going to be certain species, American robins, for example, who really only like to feed on the understory looking for insects. And then some of our warblers are really only overstory species. Um, and a ton of birds will hang out in the midstory, cardinals, chickadees, those kinds of things. And structural diversity allows for camouflage and allows for all these different species to come and these flocks of mixed birds to come through and feel kind of safe and secure while they're uh, looking for food. Water is the next really important thing for having a completely bird friendly habitat. Birds are attracted to the sound of water. Um, that, that auditory like trickle or a lot of people will use a drip lets birds know that there is fresh water there and it not won't only attract them to your yard or your community, but it'll also provide an opportunity for a lot of those migrants who are exhausted and dehydrated, a chance to, um, to get some refueling and to drink some water. And if you have a drip, it often leads to very high diversity in your own backyard. Feeders. So feeders aren't 
vital, but it is a really cool way for you to get more connected with birds and also for some of those species to, to be supported. Um, we've removed so much of the native food sources for birds, especially in like in the city, in real urban environments, that, that supporting birds with feeders is often a really good thing. And there are a number of different feeders that you can put out targeting different species of birds. I would always recommend people go to Wild Birds Unlimited. There's a bunch of different stores around the, the area um, and they can help you attract the birds that you want to see and best support birds during the right times of year. Hummingbirds, for example, you don't always need to keep your hummingbird feeder up, but during the spring and fall migration is when we have hummingbirds kind of coming through in mass. And then nest boxes. We have a couple different species of birds that really benefit from uh, nest boxes in our area. The eastern screech owls, uh, a fan favorite and one of my favorites, because we like to remove trees that how often have the cavities that these birds like, there's limited nest site for them. So su resupplementing with nest boxes is often really beneficial. This website listed, Nestwatch, you can put in your zip code and it'll spit out all the different birds that you can host with a nest box and how to build those nest boxes and how to install them. Different species of birds, nest boxes really need to be installed in really specific ways in order to welcome those birds. This is a, a cool nest box and you all might see these around your area. Um, the trails in Seabrook recently, they put two of these in. And so these are chimney swift towers. And chimney swifts are one of those species, much like purple martins that have adapted to humans being around. So they really rarely nest in natural settings now. Uh, they adapted to nesting in people's chimneys. But people don't really like having birds and a bunch of bird poop in their chimneys. Uh, so we've started to cap chimneys. And now the, these birds that, that really became reliant on human buildings um, and like smokestacks and things like that are running out of places to nest. These are a much bigger commitment and a lot of uh, different parks and stuff are putting these in. So if you see one around, um, it's, they're not going to be here right now, but during the spring and summer, you might see chimney swifts going in and out of one of, one of these towers. And we have, a, like I said, a bunch of them around the city that you can go look at. Seabrook has two new ones. Exploration Green near you guys has two of them that are pretty new and they did have nesting chimney swifts this year. If you are interested in chimney swifts, we do during the spring and summer swift night out events where you can go and count the chimney swifts at a bunch of different towers and other roosts in like old smokestacks and other buildings around the city. All right, my favorite topic, limiting dangerous threats. Let's start a poll. How many birds do free roaming cats kill in the US each year? And I'm, I'm doing this as I have two of my cats sleeping nearby. Okay, there was mixed results on this one. All right, the answer, two to four billion. So this is a really tricky topic um, and it, it really is a frustrating one for, for pet lovers and conservationists alike. Um, and I find myself in both of those categories. Cats do end up killing two to four billion birds just in the US and that's every single year. The key, is uh, keeping your cats indoors. We actively promote American Bird Conservancy's Cats Indoors initiative. They have a pledge you can take. They have a ton of cool information about how to, how to keep your cat indoors, how to make the transition from having an outdoor cat to an indoor cat. I have done it. And then they have like cool plans for things called, like, called catios. So the picture on the right is a catio where your cat can get the outdoor experience and all of that all of the excitement with being outside without the actual threat to um, birds and wildlife. And then there's options like putting your cat on a leash. I've tried this, my cats are not fond of the leash, but the, we do have uh, areas where I can supervise them um, in some outdoor activity. And then we also provide, there's other ways you can set up bird feeders near where a window where your cat can see, things like that. Um, I saw in the chat that cats can sneak out if you have a cat that is an indoor cat that sneaks out, they do make these really bright colored collars that if they do manage to sneak out, then they, the birds can see them coming because of these really kind of obnoxious bright colored collars. So there's a number of ways. Uh, American Bird Conservancy has a number of different options for helping adapt your cat to an indoor life and protecting birds and wildlife. All right, let's see. So window collisions is another huge issue for birds, especially in an urban environment. 
Between 365 and 988 million birds are estimated to die each year in the U.S. just from window collisions. And there are two types of collision issues that cities face. The first is daytime collisions. So these are most common in homes. Plants near windows, especially big windows without any kind of window like screen or blinds with plants makes birds think that they're able to fly through and kind of land on that plant. And if you do have huge windows without a screen, there is, uh, there is tape you can put on your windows that's very inconspicuous. There's also bird safe glass. There's a number of different things you can do to prevent that. And then the second one is nighttime collisions. And this is a whole different phenomena. So birds use uh, the moon and the stars to help navigate when they're migrating. And 90% of our migratory birds migrate at night. And so when they reach places like Houston, uh, they're greeted by a, a huge sky glow. And so this glow attracts these birds in and they can get really disoriented in these bright lights. And when they're disoriented and lower down, they tend to then collide with taller buildings, buildings typically three stories and higher. And so we started a program called Lights Out for Birds in 2017, 2018, right after many of you probably remember one stormy night during migration, just over 400 birds collided with the tall bank building in Galveston. And it was kind of a wake-up call for everybody. And so this building's typically really well lit and these birds got trapped in that light and they all ended up dying while they were migrating, all these beautiful, colorful birds. And so the Lights Out for Birds program is really aimed at reminding people and buildings to turn out their lights during these periods of high migration. So we've since partnered with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and some partners in Dallas and other partners in Houston to really get this program available across the state of Texas. So I encourage you to go to Lights Out Texas. If you Google Lights Out Texas, it'll bring you right to it and sign up for alerts through them. Uh, we, this was our final season of issuing our own alerts. We'll still continue to support the alerts, but they have an automated system that will send you an email when migra migration is predicted high for a region. So you can go ahead and turn your own lights out, or if you work in an office building, you can ask your office building to turn their lights out. And this is a really great way to help birds migrate safely through our region. And on this note, this spring, Philadelphia saw one of the largest mass collision events in, the, in its history. A, a thousand birds collided with a brightly lit building one migratory night uh, this past spring. And so it just shows that all of these big cities where we have really well lit buildings need to start to participate in this kind of initiative. All right, so pesticides. Pesticides, we know that like chemicals have a really bad impact on birds. Uh, DDT is the famous one for impacting eagles and pel brown pelicans. And we are continuing to use pesticides, which in small amounts and applied appropriately is okay. But one study found that areas that had higher levels of concentration of pesticide, of a pesticide, had an average rate of decline in birds of 3.5% annually. And over 10 years, they saw a huge decline in the number of birds that were around, 30%. The higher the, the concentration of the pesticides used, the more severely bird populations declined. And this goes hand in hand with the fact that birds are so reliant on insects. If we are killing all of the insects, we're not gonna have birds um, nearby feeding on those insects. And then finally, one of my favorite topics, plastic. Every seabird in the world has been recorded ingesting plastic. A recent study found that um, American oyster catchers, a uh, species we see often on our Gulf Coast, every single bird that they sampled had plastic on its stomach. And here in Galveston Bay, anytime I've done research, I've seen um, fishing line tends to be the culprit for a lot of bird deaths in our area. Um, so there's some really great work being done by other partner organizations to help battle the fishing line issue. And, and just remember that 80% of ocean plastics come from land-based sources. So any kind of cleanups we can do, any kind of efforts in our own homes to limit the amount of single-use plastic uh, we can take on, that, that is helping birds in the long run. All right, now the most fun one, getting connected with others. This is actually a really important one for bird-friendly communities because the way people get excited about protecting birds is by talking to other people who are excited and by learning cool new things about birds and seeing these bright, amazing colored birds in their own backyards. 
So get out and enjoy the birds, get yourself a pair of binoculars. And then I recommend joining a monthly bird survey. We have 13 across the city of Houston, the newest ones at Mercer Botanic Garden up near Humble, but we do have one in Armand Bayou. Or during a Christmas bird count, uh, Christmas bird count season is almost here and there is a Christmas bird count based at Armand Bayou. So if you, you can email them and sign up for one, it's a great time to get out and go birding. All of this information I've presented to you today and all of this information on where to go bird and what birds you can see where is available at birdfriendlyhouston.org. So definitely check out that website if you haven't already. It's a great resource for bird information, for plant information, and for all of the kind of things I've talked to you about. You're welcome to become a member of Houston Audubon. We're always sharing bird information and events. And then talk to your neighbors and talk to your local plant nurseries, things that you guys are already doing because you're a member of this organization. You're, you're doing the right thing to make it a more bird friendly community. And so I'm gonna go through some of my favorite inspirations for having a bird friendly yard. And you all will appreciate this because you're plant people, especially native plant people. And so this is along Buffalo Bayou, that's Tom Solomon. You probably all know him. And they've started to revegetate a lot of the banks that used to be sawed um, with native plants to help with, with um, erosion. And this is a really incredible yard. In, it's in Bel Air in Houston. And she did a great job of using all the bird friendly principles. So um, she's got a water feature. She's got nest boxes, bird feeders, all native plants. She's got different layers. So um, this is like an example we like to use a lot. And then you can, you can even do this in small spaces. Like I mentioned, we have people who have uh, worked with us who have made their balconies in their apartment complexes bird friendly by hanging up feeders and planting flowering plants in, in pots on their, on their porches. It just takes a tiny bit of space to really welcome birds and wildlife. And then it doesn't always have to be prairie. Um, a lot of our backyards and our communities are really uh, have a lot of trees now, and there are ways to, to um, still support birds and really support birds in shaded lots as well. Um, this is an example that we like to show of someone who planted a lot of native plants, but really wanted a, a more garden aesthetic. So she used some non-native plants, the monkey grass around the borders, but then planted all natives within those borders. So she's still providing the food, the different trees for um, all the different insects and supporting um, birds and wildlife in her yard. And the, this is a picture I'd like to show because it, it's a, if you plant it, they will come. So if you start to just even plant one or two native plants, as I'm sure all of you know, or hang one feeder, you're going to start to kind of reap the rewards pretty quickly. Um, these are some cedar wax wings, which uh, you should be seeing in Houston here pretty soon. Um, they're a wintering bird. So for too long, planting design has treated plants as individual objects placed in the garden for decoration. In contrast to the spirited spontaneity of wild vegetation, the landscapes of our yards, office parks, and cities are plastic assemblies of overused evergreens sheared into meatballs and vast seas of mown lawns. So it's really all about taking these things that we used to prioritize and still do prioritize in our communities and in our backyards and at our parks, um, decorative value, making screens, um, having focal points, and then balancing it with, with things that can help support the wildlife that was here long before we were. Food web value, carbon sequestration, helping wildlife just survive in our urban settings. And so a real brief run through again. So the bird friendly yard has a few major components. Native plants are really important for providing food, especially for nesting birds. Providing layers of habitat will welcome a higher diversity of different species. Uh, water is important for migratory birds in particular, but also our resident birds, especially during periods of drought. Shelter and nest sites are also a great thing to include in your yard. And then make sure you're limiting threats in your daily life, in your own yard, and go out and connect with others. So what's happening around Houston Audubon? We have some really cool ways to kind of get connected with birds and others and uh, native plants and all of that fun stuff. So our Raptor Center is open. You are welcome to go socially distance, meet the birds, see um, our native plant gardens. We also have a class that is tomorrow. I think there's still room for it. It's the winter birds of the upper Texas coast. 
So we all, we've been having a lot of our birding courses online. So you're welcome to sign up for those. It's a great way to, to get started and really get out and appreciating birds. We do still have some of our monthly ARPA and bird surveys going on. You can always go to HoustonAudubon.org and check those out. And I mentioned this earlier, but I really recommend going to check out the new canopy walkway at our Smith Oaks Sanctuary if you have a weekend and you want to go out there even just a weekend day. Right now there's nesting cormorants. So normally it's just birds nesting in the spring, but cormorants in, in our area have started to do double clutching. So there are hundreds of nesting cormorants hanging out there nesting right now. And our nursery is open. Uh, we don't have very many plants at the moment uh, because it was a busy fall, but if you are interested in seeing what we have available, we're going to keep the website open permanently. And it's houstonaudubon.org slash natives with an S nursery, and it'll bring you to the online website. You can also come and volunteer at Houston Audubon. Things are weird right now, so we don't have a ton of volunteer opportunities, but we do have monthly work days at several of our sanctuaries, and we do have some um, like socially distanced volunteer opportunities as well. All right, so now I'm gonna look through this chat and answer any questions. You can also unmute yourself and ask me a question if you would like to, but yes, I'm here to answer your questions. We do have a few questions. Um, somebody wanted to know, uh, because Houston is, is very frequently um, confronted with high ozone layers, what does that do for our birds? You know, there's very little research that's been done on this. I am calling from the Pacific Northwest right now. I'm in the process of moving, but um, there's a lab somewhere over on this side of the, uh, the country that's doing some work looking at air quality um, impacts on birds. So with the recent wildfires over on this coast, they were looking to see what that did to birds. Um, and there was some evidence that it was having some pretty dramatic impacts on birds. Um, in the, the spring, there was a lot of uh, information in the news about in a bunch of birds dropped out of the sky while they were migrating through New Mexico. And they think it was directly an impact of the smoke inhalation and like just the, how difficult it was to fly through those wildfires. So I imagine ozone is not, um, not great either. It, it, it can only just make things a little harder. Um, so birds are pretty resilient, but we keep stacking on the, um, the challenges for them. Somebody has written, how long is the canopy walk at Smith Oaks? Yeah, it's about 700 feet. It's a pretty long boardwalk and it's about 20 feet up in the air and it has some really great views of the, uh, of the, of the rookery. So you can kind of look down into the rookery now. Nice. Yeah, it's cool. Somebody would like to see the slides with the tree species and caterpillar numbers hosted again. Can you Absolutely. get that slide? Absolutely. And that information is in Doug Tallamy's book. If you haven't read it, I really recommend it. It's, it's pretty eye-opening. Okay. Um, also, I I have had people ask me, and I'm never really certain how to answer this. How is uh, Houston Audubon connected to Audubon Turn? Ah, uh, uh, okay. So Audubon is interesting in that um, national uh, the National Audubon Society has state chapters, and Audubon Turn is the uh, Audubon Texas. So it's National Audubon State Chapter runs Audubon Turn. It, Audubon also has um, city chapters, but those are typically their own entity. And so Houston Audubon is its own organization. We are affiliated with National Audubon, but they're not an overseeing um, entity over us. We're our own organization. Um, so we are, and we're a certified land trust. So um, that's all separate from Audubon Texas, but we do work together really closely with Audubon Texas. And um, also at the Christmas bird count, yes. um, the center of the bird count apparently is UHCL and but but we have got a number of bird counts going on they're going on at, at Exploration Green they're going on at Bay Oaks Country Club they're going on in Seabrook I mean we are full of yeah, I'm normally there I normally go with uh with George Guillen who is here I saw him typing in the chat um we, we go out and do the bay but I'm not there this year um but there are six area, there are six Christmas bird counts in our greater Houston Galveston area. Um, they're all on different days. So you are like able to do participate in multiple. Um, you and there, I typically do like three or four. It's a lot of fun. It's a all day like birding event. And if you are new to birding, there are opportunities for you to join with groups who will help you. Um, our 
um, education director, Marianne Weber, leads a couple monthly bird surveys that are a great beginner opportunity. And she also leads an area of the Central Houston Christmas bird count. So that would be a, a good place to go for, for newbie birders. Okay, and then someone wants to know, where do you go to see songbirds in Houston? Oh yeah, there's so many good places. Um, but if it is migration, if, okay, here's my like trick. During the spring or fall, sign up for those act, those um, lights out action alerts because when there is a lights out action alert, that means there are likely a ton of songbirds coming through our area and they're gonna be lower and hanging out um, because of just the, diver the, the density of them coming through. Um, so all the high island sanctuaries are great for seeing like colorful warblers, all the orioles. I saw painted bunting this past spring. Um, so that's really key. But if you wanna stay within the city, Arm Bayou is a great place to go birding. Um, and if you're in the like actual city, Memorial Park um, and the Houston Arboretum have some really great birding trails and our sanctuary, I'm always gonna plug our sanctuaries. Um, the Edith L. Moore Nature Sanctuary has a ton of different bird species. Um, I think we have like 200 marked on our eBird checklist, but um, there's so many places to go around Houston. It's really a good place to go birding. <laughs> Okay, another good question. Um, the bird nest cameras use UV light. UV light is bad for human eyes. How are they doing for bird eyes? You know, that's an interesting question and I have no clue. I would have to dive into that. Um, I know not very I mean, not very many people use the, the nest cameras, but there are a decent number that you can like lo log into um, to see like how nests are doing and everything. Um, uh, but, yeah, I, I have no clue. I know, I'm, I imagine it's okay. Otherwise they wouldn't be, um, they wouldn't be using them. That's the best I can answer. I'm sorry. I'd have to do more research. Okay. Um, well, some of them, some of these, I don't really understand. It says, I'd like to see the slide with the quote again. I don't know which quote oh, you have. Yeah, I, which quote. I can do that. Here we go. Let me... I will say the number one question I normally get is asking about squirrels uh, diving into feeders. Um, and there are a number of different squirrel proof feeders if that is something that you're facing. Uh, Wild Birds Unlimited has a plethora of information on bird seed, bird feeders, how to attract birds to your yard. And I think there's a couple in the Clear Lake area. There's definitely one in Pearland, but there might be one in the Clear Lake area. Um, so that's a really cool place to go. And um, Debbie put it in the chat, but uh, birdfriendlyhouston.org, we have, again, all of this information, plus more than you could ever want. Okay. There's a lot of complimentary things. I don't know if you can see the chat where you yeah, are. But people up. are appreciating this. I answer a lot of bird questions day to day. So if you have a bird question or a bird friendly communities question or any of that fun stuff, you are welcome to email me. We normally have a lot of bird friendly communities events going on. Uh, it's been a weird six plus months. So um, I was super excited to be able to, to still present to, to you guys. So thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for coming. This was wonderful. I was gonna ask one question. I do have bird feeders and I'm just amazed with the migrating birds that come through. Uh, does Wild Birds Unlimited have a specific blend that maybe they're looking for if by chance I don't have the plants? Uh, yeah, um, Wild Birds Unlimited will carry like um, specific blends for like the spring that are like basically designed to, to host a lot of the different um, migratory birds. So the warblers, the orioles, that kind of thing. Um, specifically for orioles, you can always put orange halves um, out in your like near your feeders or like kind of nail them into something. Uh, Orioles are really attracted to fruit. Um, so that's what we put out at um, Edith Elmore when it's springtime and it attracts in those really bright orange fun birds. Um, and that if you need to bird from home that are um, we have our feeders at Edith L. Moore. There is a camera there that you can log in and watch. It's always nice and the, the sounds really nice. And we also have a um, camera at uh, our Bolivar Flats Shorebird Sanctuary that um, you can often see like hundreds of thousands of American avocets foraging and the white pelicans are on there during the winter. So both of those links are on the Houston Audubon website. So it's a good way to bird from home. Thank you, Anna.